Thank you, everyone. Uh, we are now reconvening the ACIP meeting, and we will move on to the session on polio vaccines. Uh, today, I am so pleased to introduce Kathleen, Dr. Kathleen Dooling, who will be um, speaking to us about polio virus and vaccination. So, um, Dr. Dooling, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, and uh, today I'll be presenting on polio virus and polio vaccination on behalf of the newly constituted polio work group of the ACIP. Next. So the objectives of today's presentation are first to review polio virus, polio vaccination, and polio epidemiology, both in the United States and globally. And second, to review the terms of reference and membership of the ACIP polio work group. Next. So, First, poliovirus and polio vaccines. Poliovirus consists of an RNA genome enclosed in a capsid, and there are slightly different capsids uh, that, that uh, give rise to three different serotypes, type one, type two, and type three. Immunity to one of those serotypes doesn't produce significant immunity to the other serotypes. Next. So poliovirus is highly infectious. Person-to-person -person spread of poliovirus occurs via the fecal-oral or the oral-oral routes. And fecal-oral is the most important transmission pathway in settings with suboptimal hygiene and sanitation. Patients are most infectious in the days immediately before and uh, after onset of symptoms, but viruses may remain present in stool for up to six weeks and sometimes even longer. Uh, that virus can be shed in individuals with minor symptoms or even no illness at all. Next. So after... Um, infection, usually through the oropharynx and potential uh, replication in the small intestine, poliovirus can enter uh, the lymphatic system and from there enter the blood system in a viremic phase. And from there, uh, it has its adverse effects on the, the neural system. It can directly uh, damage motor neurons and if it passes the blood-brain barrier, can cause meningitis. Next step. And it's important to remember that most people who get infected with poliovirus don't have any symptoms at all. 75% of people infected are asymptomatic. Another 25% will have clinical illness, usually diarrhea or other, but no paralysis. And uh, for those uh, that develop paralytic polio, they represent less than 1% of all infections, and that varies slightly by type. So it's important to, to remember that if one paralytic case of polio is identified, that indicates an outbreak. There could be hundreds or even thousands of people who have been infected. Next slide. So let's move on now to the vaccines that we have to control uh, and uh, mitigate polio uh, infection. First is inactivated polio vaccine. Uh, so IPV contains three serotypes of the polio virus that have been chemically killed. So those viruses can't replicate, infect, or cause disease. IPV induces very effective humoral immunity, uh, which means that it is very good at preventing paralysis. Uh, about 90% of subjects will receive seroprotection after two doses and 99% seroprotection after three doses. Um, IPV induces some nasopharyngeal mucosal immunity, but limited intestinal immunity. And so what that means is that people, even who have had full courses of IPV, may still shed poliovirus in their stool if they are infected. And since the year 2000, only IPV uh, has been recommended uh, for use in the United States. Next slide. Now on to oral polio vaccine. So this is a live attenuated vaccine which contains a live weakened polio virus. It's given orally and then it usually replicates in the gut and is shed in the stool. It prevents paralysis and transmission of polio virus. Uh, it's the vaccine of choice in developing countries or countries that are experiencing polio outbreaks. However, if it's allowed to circulate in under-immunized populations for long enough, attenuated viruses can revert to a form that causes paralysis. Next slide. Next on to discuss polio in the United States and global eradication efforts. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, 
paralytic polio decreased rapidly in the U.S. after introduction of uh, the polio vaccine, the inactivated polio vaccine in 1955, and then subsequently uh, the oral polio virus was used in 1961 in the U.S. Uh, shortly thereafter, the U.S. saw its last uh, wild-type case of polio virus, and by 19, uh, that was in 1979, and by 1994, the Americas were certified polio-free. Um, in 2000, the ACIP uh, voted to only use inactivated polio vaccine uh, going forward. Next slide. So now to look globally, in 1988, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative was established uh, based on a vote at the World Health Assembly. Great progress was made, and by 2015, uh, wild polio virus type 2 was actually eradicated. Uh, in 2016, the Sabin type 2 portion uh, was withdrawn from the oral polio vaccine in uh, a maneuver that was globally known as the switch. By 2019, wild polio virus type 3 was eradicated. And here we arrive at 2022 with only two countries that still have endemic wild type uh, polio virus. That's type 1. However, numerous vaccine derived polio virus outbreaks uh, are being detected. Next slide. This gives a depiction of a WHO uh, world map, whereas you can see uh, in colored in yellow are Pakistan and Afghanistan that still have uh, endemic transmission of type 1 wild type poliovirus. However, if you look at all the green dots, uh, you can see that there are numerous places uh, that have circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus cases. Next slide. So that brings us to a uh, recent uh, history with a case of par paralytic polio in New York State in 2022. So the presentation was that a, an immun unimmunized, immunocompetent young adult developed fever, neck stiffness, back pain, abdominal pain, and constipation. Uh, three days later, uh, this person developed lower extremity weakness. And two days after the weakness began, the patient presented to an emergency department and was admitted to the hospital with, uh, with flaccid weakness. And as part of the, of the differential diagnosis was worked up for acute flaccid myelitis, also known as AFM. Next. So as part of that workup, um, specimens were submitted, uh, including stool, NP, OP, uh, and CSF. And the stool specimen was positive for enterovirus by PCR. Subsequent sequencing identified a vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2, or a VDPV2. This was confirmed by the CDC polio laboratory. And uh, the sequence indicated that there were 10 nucleotide changes in the region that encodes the viral capsid protein, also known as BP1, compared to the Sabin strain. And uh, this indicates that the uh, virus had been likely circulating for about a year uh, since it was, uh, you know, uh, it's in, in its original Sabin form. Um, and once again, I'd like to remind people that a single paralytic case implies hundreds and possibly thousands of infections. Next slide. So this is a depiction of the New York wastewater polio testing map, current as of October 11th. Um, and you'll see here uh, the southern part of New York State. In the blue are uh, sewer sheds that have tested positive for poliovirus uh, type 2, ones in fact that are genetically linked to the Rockland case patient. And as you can see, uh, given that there's transmission in multiple locations in New York metropolitan region, and this has persisted over months, this uh, qualifies as a circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 and has been reported as such. Next slide. So let's take a closer look now at um, the vaccine coverage of two of the affected counties in New York. Um, so this, this slide really highlights the power of uh, understanding vaccine coverage at the zip code level, uh, which you know, can, can uh, illuminate heterogeneity uh, even within a county. So as of August 1st, 2022, Rockland County and Orange Counties had several zip code areas with less than 70% three-dose polio vaccine coverage among children two years old. You can see those there in the uh, dark red colors. Next slide. 
Um, New York and the counties affected have worked extremely hard to, uh, to catch up and vaccinate uh, their populations. And polio vaccine doses administered between July 21st, when uh, the case was first um, uh, notified in the media, to September 25th, compared to that same period in 2021. Uh, polio vaccine uptake amongst uh, children has increased 42% in Rockland County and 29% in Orange County. So still work to be done, um, but progress is being made. Next slide. And now on to ACIP recommendations for polio vaccination. So routine childhood schedule in the United States uh, consists of four IPV doses. Uh, those are routinely given at two months, four months, between six to 18 months, and then a booster dose at four to six years. Next slide. There are uh, numerous polio-containing vaccine products on the market in the United States. Uh, one is an IPV uh, polio-only uh, containing vaccine, and the remainder are combination vaccines, which, of course, are preferred um, uh, in, in most circumstances. Next slide. Uh, the safety of IPV vaccine is well proven with uh, the only contra contraindications being severe allergic reactions after a previous dose uh, or a vaccine component. Precautions uh, including pregnancy or moderate severe acute illness um, on the day uh, that one would be vaccinated. And local reactions including pain, redness and swelling appeared in about three to 18% of people and severe reactions are rare. Next slide. So the guidance for polio immunization uh, for adults, uh, this is the current guidance on the CDC website and has been interpreted from the uh, ACIP statement, uh, which date ba dates back all the way to the year 2000 was the last time it was updated. So uh, to go through those in detail, adults who are unvaccinated or have incomplete vaccination for polio virus should talk to their doctor about getting vaccinated. Adults at increased risk of exposure to polio virus may receive one lifetime booster dose. And examples of adults who are deemed to be at increased risk of exposure include travelers who are going to countries where there's an increased risk of exposure, laboratory and healthcare workers who handle specimens that might contain polio viruses, healthcare workers or caregivers who have close contact with a person who could be infected with poliovirus, unvaccinated adults who, uh, whose children will be receiving oral polio vaccine, for example, international adoptees or refugees, and unvaccinated adults living or working in a community where poliovirus is circulating. Next. So there have been a number of innovations in polio vaccination in, in recent years, and we thought it, it uh, good to, to bring those up here, and these will be uh, points of discussion for the polio work group. Next. So novel oral polio virus vaccine type 2 was developed to better respond to the evolving risk of circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2. NOPV is more genetically stable and less likely to be associated with the emergence of uh, circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus. It uh, can provide mucosal immunity to limit uh, the spread even amongst IPV vaccinated people. And it was approved for use under the WHO emergency use listing in November 2020. Uh, safety data on the first 65 million doses of NOPV that were used for outbreak response was reviewed by the Independent Global Advisory Committee on Vaccine Safety, and they concluded that there were no obvious red flags or safety concerns. And for countries that have eliminated polio and only use IPV, such as the United States, uh, the WHO um, Strategic Advisory Group of Experts recommends uh, to res uh, respond to circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus with routine and catch-up uh, immunization uh, with IPV. That should be continued. And countries should consider use of NOPV if IPV response does not stop the circulating VDPV. For example, uh, if the outbreak spreads beyond a well-defined population group or geographic area, or if transmission persists. Next slide. Another innovation uh, has been the fractional dose IPV. So many countries now are switching to IPV only schedules. Um, and although the United States has a stable and secure supply of IPV, the global IPV shortage has limited the number of doses available. 
fractional IPV uh, administered intradermally using one-fifth of the regular dose stretches the limited supplies of IPV. The use of fractional dosing has been recommended by WHO as a response strategy for uh, VDPV2 outbreaks. And currently, fractional doses are not recognized uh, as a dose which satisfies immunization requirements in the United States. Next slide. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to the work group chair, uh, Dr. Oliver Brooks, uh, to lead us through the uh, terms of reference and uh, constitution of the work group. Thank you, Dr. Dooling. Uh, so since this outbreak occurred in New York, it was determined that we need to revisit polio. I guess it's really that simple. And so we, we have, as a, uh, as a work group, have met once only, and we're looking to the ACIP as a whole to look at the terms of reference that we have determined and uh, offer any suggestions or comments regarding this. Uh, so we have these four. So whether more specific guidance on adult vaccination, which was addressed in the presentation, I believe that goes back 20 years, so it hasn't been addressed in a while, including the use of adult booster doses can be provided in the context of circulating polio virus, which we now see. Whether adults who are immunocompromised should be recommended an additional adult booster dose of a polio containing vaccine, whether we use fractional, which you see the WHO said, but we do not, um, as pre-qualified by WHA, should meet polio vaccination requirements, including for people immigrating to the U.S., and consider criteria under which novel oral polio vaccine might be used in areas with outbreaks or persistent circulation of polio virus. So, like I said, we've met once, and this is where we are with our terms of, uh, terms of reference. Uh, next slide. So, I just want to recognize, first of all, Kathleen and the CDC for convening this work group, and uh, my other partner here, who is an ACIP voting member, uh, Lynn Bada, who does have experience with polio. Uh, Lynn, I don't know if you want to make any comments before we just open up the floor to any recommendations or discussion. No, I have no comments right now. Thank you. So go back one slide, please. So that's where we are right now. So any, uh, I guess I'll turn it back over to Grace. So any comments, though, that anyone may have regarding this, because we're right at the very beginning of this work group. Any questions or um, feedback? Dr. Cotton. Thanks. This has um, engendered a lot of questions in my workplace. Um, I was wondering, so for the ACIP polio immunization recommendations for adults, adults who are unvaccinated or have incomplete vaccination for polio should talk to the doctor about getting vaccinated. And people are asking me, they say, well, I'm seeing a 70-year-old person who doesn't have their vaccine records. Do I need to vaccinate them? So what is the guidance in that context where they were born and brought up in the United States. They went to schools in the United States. What do you say there? Because I, I'm worried that a lot of people are actually maybe giving polio vaccine, and um, I'm worried about supply and whether that's appropriate use. And then I also have a question about immunocompromised as well. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Janelle Ruth, and I am the team lead for the acute flaccid myelitis and domestic polio team. I think it's an excellent question, and uh, we've been getting a lot of public inquiries as well about uh, older adults who have lost their vaccination records, can't remember whether they were vaccinated. I think, you know, in general, we say unless there are specific reasons to believe an adult was not vaccinated as a child, um, adults who were born and raised in the United States likely did um, have polio vaccine as a child, um, you know, given the fact that uh, vaccination started back in the uh, late 1950s and, and early 1960s. Uh, it's most reasonable uh, to expect that they were vaccinated. Uh, large campaigns were made uh, in, to get all ch school children vaccinated. And so we're really trying to have a conversation with those uh, folks about how um, 
how they are most likely to be vaccinated, even though those, those vaccination records aren't available. I think if somebody is particularly concerned or again, might uh, live or work in an area where uh, poliovirus is circulating, uh, I think the safety of IPV suggests that they could go ahead and get an additional booster. But at this time, we are not recommending it widely. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. So I have a few comments or a few questions. First of all, um, was this, the, the water testing, what, did that occur at the time that this patient was diagnosed or do we have data from before and in other communities that where, because I mean, we, there's people who visit the United States all the time who, who come here and live here who have had poliovirus, oral poliovirus. So they're going to be shedding it. And so do we have that data, first of all? Okay. So uh, Dr. Sanchez, thank you. We have been following the global guidance which suggests that um, environmental surveillance for poliovirus is uh, best done in connection to a case. So we're not recommending at this point you know, widespread uh, wastewater surveillance, but we have been conducting rigorous wastewater surveillance around the case patient in New York State, uh, both retrospectively, so looking uh, back previously from the date of uh, paralysis onset and then moving forward. We have found detections of poliovirus linked to the case patient uh, earlier, so prior to um, the paralysis onset in uh, the months of May and April, and we are continuing to find uh, detections of this uh, poliovirus linked to the case patient's virus moving forward uh, in subsequent months, uh, August and September. But you don't have that data then from other areas like let's say Boston or, or California or wherever? So um, again, we've really focused on looking at communities that might have contact with uh, the New York State community. And so we have done additional wastewater testing in New Jersey and Connecticut. Um, but all of those specimens to date have been negative. Now, I'll, I'll say that in New Jersey, we didn't test specifically in the county where uh, we might find communities that have ties back to the New York State community, but um, are moving forward to, to look at that. Uh, Again, in other states that border New York, we have not uh, moved, moved forward to do additional wastewater testing at this time. And this was a type 2, right? But type 2 was removed from the oral polio vaccine. So where's... Where's it coming from? Yeah. <laughs> So, so you're right. Uh, now for routine immunization, bivalent OPV is being used, which contains only types one and three. And as Dr. Dooling alluded to, that switch was made in 2016. However, because of the ongoing circulating vaccine-derived uh, poliovirus outbreaks, the response to those outbreaks has to be with oral polio vaccine type two. And so... Um, in, in uh, previous years, they've been using a monovalent oral polio vaccine type 2. And that monovalent, uh, it's sort of this, this chicken and egg cycle where the monovalent OPV, when given uh, to prevent uh, subsequent spread of the outbreak in under-vaccinated communities, can circulate and seed new VDPV2 outbreaks. I think that's changing with the novel OPV2 um, coming on board. Over 500 million doses, I think, have now been given worldwide. And so I think we're all hoping with um, the lower rate of, uh, of um, or the, I guess the um, stability of this virus so it doesn't uh, revert back to neurovirulence uh, quite as often, uh, almost never, uh, we'll start to see a decrease in those uh, outbreaks moving forward but that is where it's coming from. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shaw. Just a, a few quick observations. As Dr. Romero and Janelle and others are well aware, this has been a very frequent topic of conversation among state health officials. Janelle has been with us on numerous occasions to walk us through this. Um, one observation on the communications front, uh, given the complexity of poliovirus, particularly with terms like vaccine-derived, there is this notion out there that polio just happens sometimes, or indeed, it is perhaps tethered to vaccination, when in fact, we should all be very clear in our communications that 
the occurrence of polio right now in Rockland County and elsewhere is directly related to the under vaccination. Uh, and th and that, that fact is sometimes, it sometimes gets lost and just underscoring that for everyone as we're all communicating. Uh, there are certainly outstanding questions out there around uh, the pros and cons of greater use of wastewater testing. Uh, I know that's not in the purview of the working group, which takes me to my last uh, observation for Dr. Brooks and, and Ms. Bata, which is a, uh, a frequent question that's come up among state health officials, is the why not switch to the novel OPV, given the mucosal benefits of it. Um, and so we, we look forward to reading and, and discussing what the working group comes up with there. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Talbot? Yeah, I think this goes back to the question about the older adult in the United States. Um, I live in a pocket of the U.S. where um, there was a lot of disparity in health care, and there still is a lot of disparity. Um, and tetanus is one of those things where we have cases of older black women who get tetanus because they were never vaccinated, but their male counterparts were because they were expected to serve in the military or served in the military. Hmm. Um, and so do we have data on polio vaccination in non-white groups um, to give us some idea about that population? But as in older adults, not current. So, um you know, I know we do look at vaccination by uh, race and ethnicity in children and uh, doses that are reported into the immunization information systems across the uh, different jurisdictions. I don't actually know whether we capture that information for adults. And also, you're referencing adults who are, you know, let's say 50s, 60s, 70s, whatever, my guess, without knowing, is that race and ethnicity was not collected 30 years ago on vaccine um, immuniz uh, in administration in adults. Thank you. Dr. Lear? Yes, Dr. Romero. So I, I think it's also important to keep in mind the epidemiology of the disease, wild-type disease, right, prior to the vaccination period. And, and that is prior to vac vaccinating uh, the United States in general, prior to 1955, because that's when, when the vaccine was introduced and, and we worked with I IPV at that time, right? Prior to that, this was a widely circulating virus, right? And most individuals were exposed during childhood. Um, and, and most individuals of that age group probably have natural, natural immunity to wild-type poliovirus. Um, and, uh, you know, they were boosted with the vaccine. So they, the older individuals probably have natural immunity that exists. Now, uh, th that we can get that, those numbers specifically, I don't think we can get them for you, but, but we will look. Uh, thank you. Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I, I have two questions that are sort of geared towards the medium to long term, but... Um, how does what we decide as a committee fit into the global strategy? And I guess I ask that in the context of use of oral polio uh, outside the U.S. and risk of importation here, um, you know, that kind of thing. And then I have, I have a second question. It's a, it's a great question with regards to um, how this fits into the global strategy. I think we have been talking to our global immunization colleagues about that very question. And I think it... You know, the question for them is, uh, what does eradication actually mean now in the context of these ongoing circulating BDPV outbreaks? Uh, now that we found it in the United States, uh, does eradication mean no paralysis versus actually eliminating the virus uh, from the environment uh, across the world? And so I think it's, it's something good to consider as we move forward with these NOPV discussions in the United States. I think it's going to be an important factor to understand how they're viewing eradication, and that probably will lend itself to, um, to how we might think about using it here. And then my, my other question is, what's our metric of success? in terms of our management of this as an outbreak? And, and is it, I mean, I, I don't know enough about the, the circulation through wastewater and then how, as it relates to cases, because clearly an unvaccinated 20-year-old is clearly at risk, but, 
but does does success i mean part of success is no more cases of paralysis for sure and then does and then vaccination should lead to that but does vaccination also then lead to decreased circulating in the in the sewer water and over what time frame so kind of what are our metrics as an immunization program for success as we make policy decisions about vaccination so those are all really good questions. Um, we, again, questions that we have been talking about internally on the response. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely right. Success means no more cases of paralysis, but I think it also means elimination of the circulating virus in wastewater, because as long as we have wastewater detections of this circulating virus linked back to the case patient's virus, we know there is ongoing transmission in the community, even without paralysis. So, um, you know, we can talk uh, certainly about the dynamics of transmission, I think, in, in the United States, uh, which um, for the most part, we have good sanitation and, and hygiene. Transmission of poliovirus is more oral-oral than it is fecal-oral. We do know that IPV provides some um, nasopharyngeal mucosal immunity. And so um, certainly uh, recent uh, global deliberations have said that uh, they do recommend continued IPV use for outbreak response in, uh, in countries that only use IPV in their routine immunizations. And so we are certainly following uh, that guidance right now. Um, as Dr. Dulin alluded to, if we start to see um, this virus break out of its current geography and population, I think then we need to start thinking about other methods. But um, to me, the metric of, um, of seeing this uh, outbreak end is seeing uh, no more virus detections in wastewater. And that will take time. Um, the, globally, again, they recommend uh, testing for an additional six months after the last uh, positive uh, detection in wastewater. And so uh, currently we have a ways to go. Thank you, Dr. Romero. So I, I, I think a comment is, is worthwhile here based on what um, has been said um, and uh, what Dr. Sanchez said. So we, we have, we are a global society, right? People move very quickly from parts of the world which use vaccine, oral polio vaccine, and bring it in. So I think it's important to keep in mind that we have, that to say that something is broken out of its environment, right, where we see it now, really requires genomic sequencing and, well, and understanding this. Because finding the virus, for example, I, I will use just a city. It, that doesn't mean that they're at risk or not. But let's say um, Chicago, right, because Chicago is a travel hub, right? That doesn't mean that it came from New York. And so that in itself does not mean that there's a spread or breaking out of the virus. It's very important that we understand that. And, and the public has to understand that also, that our ability, our, our ability to, sur to surveil, right, for this virus uh, for, currently outstrips our ability to understand really how this virus is traveling around the world. So I, I think that's an important issue to keep in mind. Thank you. Dr. Long? Uh, I'm sure th I'm going to wait till she's... Let me just clarify too. Dr. Sanchez, do you have your hand raised? I do no? have a question, okay. but he's talking to the question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know her name. Dr. Long. Yes, I have a question for you. Um, so with the um, enormous increase in the number of clinical detections of enterovirus rhinovirus that now, you know, the... Um, Biofire identifies together and doesn't separate. Uh, I'm wondering if you're looking at some of those at CDC for lesser diseases than acute flaccid paralysis to know if we do have any circulating uh, strains in the United States. Or do you only look when you have acute flaccid paralysis? Because if for us clinicians, it, an enterovirus is an enterovirus, and a poliovirus is an enterovirus, and that's all we'd he hear, and we don't look unless there's something special about the case that's neurologic. So um, I can definitely say that uh, we have a platform um, that 
data from that platform has probably been, been shared widely in uh, ACIP, the New Vaccine Surveillance Network, or MVSN, which is a uh, system of seven pediatric centers across the country that test for a number of different respiratory viruses, including EVRV. Um, the only rapid assay we have to distinguish further is uh, for enterovirus D68. So those sites across that network do test EVRV specimens for EVD68, but any additional um, typing of those specimens would need to be done through sequencing. Uh, some of that is done at, on, um, at those sites and others come to CDC for sequencing. But for the most part, um, I think we have the most data around EVD68, which I think we all know is um, what we now think is likely responsible for those every other year outbreaks of AFM until uh, 2018 was our last outbreak. And interestingly, this year, even though we did see an uptick in EVRV uh, respiratory illness over the summer, and uh, at many sites uh, that was due to EVD68, we did not see a concurrent upswing in AFM cases, which uh, brings on additional questions, but also a lot of relief. Thank you, Dr. Zahn. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, Janelle, just a, a general question about wastewater monitoring. You know, in the in the era of COVID, we've done wastewater monitoring, and we've had assistance from uh, sanitation districts. But of course, they're not. They don't work under public health, and it's an it's an extra quote unquote thing for them to do, and so they've done it. But very often. Um, it's not necessarily the first priority and it's taken a period of time for them to get on board. Um, can you talk a little to your experience in New York or what you'd anticipate? Obviously, polio is a different level of agitation or concern, um, but how quickly wastewater man you know, monitoring can get set up in a community, how easy it is to maintain over time. I don't know if you could speak to that, but I'm interested in the New York experience if nothing else. Uh, Matt, that's a great question. Uh, uh, nice to hear your voice. And, uh, you know, this again is why I think we've really um, adhered to the global guidance that in countries that have eliminated polio, uh, the maintenance of polio elimination is really around good surveillance for acute flaccid paralysis, which we have with AFM, and strong vaccination coverage, which again, uh, we know that there are pockets of under vaccination, but for the for the majority of the United States, we have good uh, IPv3 vaccination coverage. And that wastewater testing should be used judiciously to understand the size and the scope of an outbreak around a polio case. Um, I would say there are a number of critical considerations that are needed to think about before rolling out wastewater testing. Um, first and foremost is containment issues. So again, um, poliovirus type 2 is under containment. If it is found in the wastewater, uh, there are a series of requirements that go into place, not just with wastewater samples, but with all uh, samples that could potentially contain poliovirus, and that includes clinical specimens like stool, respiratory swabs, et cetera. Um, the second issue is um, response. So if a poliovirus of public health importance is detected in wastewater, it behooves the jurisdiction then to roll into response, which means essentially improving vaccination coverage in those areas. And, um, and that's an effort, right? That takes resources, it takes uh, the acquiring of vaccine and the mobilization of, um, of access points to get vaccines into arms. Um, the third point I want to make um, is, is just communication around uh, these potential detections of poliovirus in wastewater and, and how to communicate that to communities. I think, again, it is challenging. Uh, there's a lot of worried well out there that um, hearing a detection of poliovirus in wastewater can uh, spur them to go and want vaccination where it might not be the best use of resources. And so... Um, you know, again, just thinking very critically about how we communicate what we're looking for and what we're going to use with that information if we find it. Um, I'll go back uh, to something that uh, Dr. Mark Palanche often says, and, and I've been trying to, to adhere to, which is uh, 
even in the absence of polio virus detections in wastewater, we should be trying to improve vaccination coverage across the United States. And so even, you know, regardless of whether we find polio in wastewater, it's very important to identify those communities of under vaccination, determine the barriers and challenges to getting vaccines into arms, and then work to improve um, and, and, to, and to provide uh, strategies to, to improve vaccination coverage. I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. That was actually a perfect ending to a wonderful day. <laughs> the committee has actually completed its business for today. Are there any objections to adjourning today's meeting? Okay, uh, Dr. Wharton, anything else? Uh, nothing else, Dr. Lee. All right, well, I am now officially adjourning today's ACIP meeting. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow at 8.30.